So uh, welcome everybody to this Apre Cool. Uh, my name is Frank Fafaro. I'm part of the uh, English Pedagogical Consultants, EPC, along with Rishi Ash here, who is uh, Mark and Emily at the moment. And my colleague, Ellen LeBeuf is also here. I'm not sure who else of our team is uh, participating or here in attendance. Uh, the screen doesn't allow for all the names to be seen at once. Thank you, Abby. <laughs> and Abby too from Rishi Ash, how can I possibly forget? Uh, today's Apre Cool really is a culmination of uh, the experimentation that teachers have been pretty much thrown into because of COVID with the teaching uh, online and what are some of the implications of teaching online. And today we're really, really happy to have uh, Sarah Chenette. Sarah Chenette is the uh, English language arts teacher over at the Western Quebec School Board. Uh, she was formerly uh, here at the English Montreal School Board. So there's a, there's a quite a bit of envy on my part that the Western Quebec School Board managed to snatch up the uh, talents and skills of Sarah Chenette. Um, this Apte Cool will have an English language arts flavor to it because that's the subject area that Sarah Chenette is specialized in. However, what we're hoping to accomplish here today is that some of the techniques, some of the organization, some of the things that Sarah has done is not solely subject specific, meaning that if there are math, science and CCBE teachers that are here, there are some strategies and techniques that which you can glean and then apply into your own classroom. So this is what we're trying to uh, uh, we're trying to convey here is that it's a teacher's experience experience with experimenting with uh, digital uh, lessons and online learning. Uh, it will have an ELA flavor, as I mentioned, and it also will have a Teams reference flavor. But if you're using Google Classroom or some other medium, it still applies. It's in the fact that how she organized and presented her class and courses uh, that really matter here. So. Um, Without much further delay, I'd like to present Sarah Chenette, and please do take over and start with your uh, PowerPoint, if you will, to try to share your screen or just present yourself and the reality you find yourself in, just like many other teachers do. Thanks, Sarah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Frank. Thank you for that introduction. It is really nice to um, see some old colleagues and some new colleagues all in uh, one spot since, uh, since I switched over, so I appreciate that. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I'm hoping to share some things with you today. Um, I dubbed this motivation in the time of Corona. Hopefully we're out of Corona and, uh, the motivation things still apply afterwards. Um, so, okay. So just a little bit about me. This is a picture <laughs> from today in my classroom. Luckily, uh, we got to switch to the glasses afterwards with the, the side, uh, shields, but that was for a while there that I was wearing that kind of hockey helmet uh, for a bit there in the winter. Um, so a little bit about me, if you don't know who I am, um, I did a B.Ed. in an ed tech program. Um, I specifically chose that one is at Nipissing. So I did have an introduction to ed tech really early on in uh, before my career. <laughs> um, and then I went right into teaching adult education at the EMSB for almost 10 years. And uh, just recently, uh, about two years ago, I moved to Ottawa and uh, luckily the WQSB uh, took me on uh, as a teacher. So um, most of my experience is in adult education. That's pretty much it. Um, okay, so my context, just so you know, like these, obviously we all have different contexts. We know it varies from center to center. I've worked at a lot of centers at this point. Um, so I am doing individualized ELA, English language arts, which means I'm, you know, quote unquote, teaching 16 ELA courses at once. Uh, so we use the SOFAD books and any predetermined programming at this school. Uh, we teach in two hour blocks and we've done all, I don't know what your experience has been, but we've actually done a bunch of different models this year. We started right off the bat in uh, August 28th with the hybrid learning. So we weren't actually all in the center. Um, I know some centers didn't get that opportunity. We started right away with the alternate day model, 12 in class, 12 online. Uh, in the winter, we switched to a different hybrid learning model where it was the two day model where we had uh, groups in uh, once a week. So two days of students. And then most recently we did open up. I did get to see students this week. So that was really lovely. Um, but we just, we're just coming off a almost six week uh, lockdown here in the Western Quebec area. So we were doing online learning only for a while. Um, we also did, I, I, my understanding as well, that not all uh, centers had this, but we actually had some PED days 
at the beginning of the year in August to learn teams. So we learned teams, you know, before we were thrown in with students, which we were very, very lucky to have. And um, at our center, we have a camera on school-wide policy. So I don't know if that varies or not, but that's that was our, um, our context. So before I do this, uh, I feel like it would be almost irresponsible not to acknowledge uh, some uh, parts of this year uh, that have been different than other years. Um, this has been hard. <laughs> I don't know how you feel about it. And I, if it hasn't been hard for you, I celebrate that. That's amazing. And if it has been hard for you, I completely see you. This has been hard. All right. And I think we do need to uh, acknowledge that among colleagues. Um, I've been, even with the context of ed tech and having ped days and all those things, I am still, I have been still learning on the fly. I have been absolutely stumbling my way through this year, which is, you know, hard for teachers, I think. Um, and it's uh, definitely been an exercise in uh, self-reflection and humility for sure throughout this year. Um, I did make modifications throughout the year to suit my learners needs. And I did make modifications to suit my needs as well as I'm also, you know, we are also going through this year with all the changes. Um, and so, you know, at the beginning I was doing everything. I was like, you know, journals, daily things, e exit tickets, and this, and that, and that, all these things. And I felt myself burning out before we even got started. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge that like this is been modified a lot. There are other things that were there that I, that I ended up taking away. And so I hope that you also modified your teaching for your needs as well, um, because that's important. And the last thing um, I just wanted to say is that, um, especially in the last six weeks, a lot of these things that I'm gonna show you, these strategies and stuff, um, I did find that when we were locked down, the longer we were locked down, um, I did watch. I know it's been really hard for us to watch our, our students' mental health decline, absolutely. And motivation became harder and harder to foster. The longer I didn't see them at least once a week or something, it just got so difficult. And so if that's your experience, I, I hope it's not your experience, but if it is, it's very normal. And um, I do think that these strategies do work better when we're doing hybrid or at least have the students in the classroom. Good. Everyone kind of feeling that a little bit. I just wanted to get that out of the way because I felt that it was irresponsible not to in the first place. All right. Okay, so let's uh, get started. So having said that, um, my goal today is that you leave with a ready-made tool or a strategy that you can easily modify, easily just integrate into your uh, teaching reality, whatever that is. Obviously, we don't know what's going to happen next year, but I do hope they're useful for you in the future as well. Um, and if you don't, if you're doing all these things or you're doing more than that, um, I hope you leave here with a little sense of community, maybe a little sense of peace of mind that we're kind of all doing our best in this mess, right? And that is, that is the idea. We all know what motivation is at this point. We all know how important it is with adult learners. Um, Malcolm Shepard Knowles is actually uh, an American educator who coined the term andragogy, andra, andragogy. It's always a hard word because of pedagogy, andragogy. Um, anyways, he coined the word uh, andragogy as synonymous with adult education. And he laid out four principles that became central to adult learners. Interesting, interestingly enough, he added a fifth uh, principle four years later, which was motivation. And that seems actually kind of odd to me because I find that this is one of the most important things, whether they come into the classroom with motivation or they at some point leave with some sense of motivation, it is very important when it comes to our adult learners. Um, and so, uh, according to Knowles, as a person matures, their motivation um, to learn becomes more internal. This depends on obviously the age of our students. Uh, I, I've noticed over years, I have some younger, younger students in there, and this takes a little bit more practice with the younger students. Um, and I don't know if we have that, that experience with your older students, I find that's it's there as well. So in doing research, I've been really interested in motivation for years. And um, in studying motivation and self-directed learning, I found that there were four concepts that kept coming up. Now, these aren't laid out as the concepts of motivation. They're just things that 
as I was reading, I saw that they were the most applicable to my students and my reality. And so those four uh, concepts are accountability, which I'm going to call learner responsibility, um, goal setting. Everyone knows about that, obviously, but getting students to do it, different story, of course. Um, choice. And the last one being safe, supportive environments. Now, much easier said than done when there isn't a screen separating you from your students, right? So I just want to show you how I've attempted uh, to translate these four concepts into my online classroom. And this is just like a little picture. I don't know if you can see uh, of this setup that we have at school and it's a little messy and there's a Tim Hortons there because that is from today. That is today's, uh, today's Sarah's desk. <laughs> All right. So uh, like Frank mentioned, um, everything is done on Microsoft Teams for me. And I'm, so I'm going to be referencing uh, Microsoft Teams and the collaboration space um, and OneNote as well. All of these things can be translated into, like Frank said, other spaces. So if you have any questions or you even want different resources, um, I have a bunch of links as well for that. Um, in the kind of uncertainty of this year, I actually don't normally do this this structured, but because there was so much uncertainty this year, I decided to really have a day-to-day -day structure with my students so that they could at least expect, you know, what was going to happen on Mondays, what was going to happen on Tuesdays, and so forth. Um, and I'll, I'll go through some of the details of some of these. Uh, Monday was called Motivation Monday. Uh, as an ELA teacher, I really like alliteration, and my students know it. Um, Tuesday became a uh, bad dad jokes. No offense to any dads out there. It's, uh, it's <laughs> not a bad thing. Um, uh, I started this actually more so when we were online just to keep morale high. As you can see, I've given you a little example here. Um, awful jokes. The best part of the, the week is watching them just sort of coil with disgust at how bad the joke is. If so, if you just want to make your week better, it's so great. Um, it's really great. Um, Wednesdays are for mini workshops. Again, like you know, I'm doing uh, individualized. We still try and slide in some mini workshops in there for the students. Thursdays, we do sentence correction. And Friday is all about communication and connection. So that's the kind of context of our day-to-day -day, uh, basis at my center in my classroom. I just wanted to let you know, Sarah, that all of the dads, including me, are really, really looking to... Uh... Come to your class on Tuesday. Okay. Lots of material. So actually, I, I got my dad a, um, a little gift years ago of dad jokes. I don't know if you can see this. And I had to borrow it from him. I borrowed it from him. And I take these jokes every day. So yeah, I'm really into the, really into the dad jokes. It's great. Come by anytime. Um, so we're going to start with learner responsibility, which I, we call accountability as well. And I just want to explain a little bit about how in the individualized classrooms uh, students get their information. And so I don't know if you can see this picture here, um, but in the assignment section of Teams, I know this is in Google Classroom as well, I created the assignments for all 16 courses and then you can easily just reuse them just by assigning to each student. And um, in this assignments tab, it doesn't actually have individual assignments or anything like that. It actually has the course outline, the end of course outcomes. Uh, I use something called a writing response checklist um, and any resources, the students, so YouTube links, uh, slides they need for their course, it all goes in there. It's for them to go check when they need it. All right. Knowing that the learner is actually responsible for going to read all that information and setting up their own online class notebook. And so what, what I ended up doing uh, in my class, mostly because um, I didn't want to be taking their books home with the corona and all those things, is I would have my own set of books at home and at school, and the student would actually set up their notebook and only write the answers to the questions. So they indicate the page number and they write the answers to the questions, and I can access this all the time. The setup for the notebook is at the end of their course outline. And if you can see, it says organizing your team's class notebook there. And I give them a list of titles. And they are responsible for taking that information and setting up their own class notebook. Um, for us, we do essential assignments. So there's certain pages we're using SOFED, as you know, and I know a lot of schools do, and some don't if you get to teach. Um, but 
there's an answer key in the back of the book for a lot of this stuff and they use it. We know that. And so the only, I don't really want to see that stuff. The things I want to see is the application of that knowledge. And so it's something called, we call them WRCs in our class, which is writing response checklist. And those are the main assignments that um, they need to show me to move on to the next learning situation. And so what they do is uh, when they finish one of those WRCs, they are also responsible. I'm not checking their notebooks every day. That would be insanity. I would never sleep. But when they finish a WRC, they are going to message me and say, hey, miss, which is what they call me. Uh, hey, miss, can you check out WRC page 29? I write it on my list and I give them feedback later on. So they're responsible for all of that in this case. Does it always work? I wouldn't say it always works, but they do get encouraged every time to do it again, do it again, and they eventually um, get it, which is nice. So this is what it looks like in, in the class notebook, just so you have an idea. And so this student is doing uh, 4111. They've set up all their pages in advance, so they know the exact path they need to take to get to their credits. And this is an example of what it looks like as the student goes through. So when a student finishes something, I take a look and I'm actually the one that writes done. I write everything in green. And so, you know, maybe there's comments. So when I put comments for the, just to see me, but if I put comments, the student opens up their notebook every single day, they go down the list and they go, hey, comments. And the next thing they need to do is right here at the bottom. This was definitely a learning curve. Absolutely, it was a lot of screen time. I, I will acknowledge that, um, but it was a very easy way for me, especially transitioning from hybrid to different hybrid to online to back, like, oh, all over the place. It was really easy for me to just keep track of their work. Nothing got changed. It was all the same the whole way through, which was nice. Any questions about this part? Sarah, I have a quick question concerning how much time and, and energy was spent actually familiarizing the students with Teams and the layout of Teams. I mean, obviously, that's part of the teaching that's gone into this and the way you've set it up. I'm just wondering how long that took and uh, the buy-in. Was, uh, was it problematic or were they on board fairly quickly? They were, they were mostly on board for sure. Um, I would say that there were some here or there students that really struggled with that, but we negotiated those. So some of my students that re aren't really tech savvy um, or that maybe had a learning difficulty that made that sort of concept difficult, um, we would negotiate with, they still had to set up their notebook, but if they did it in their book, for example, they would write work done in booklet. So I would negotiate with, with the students based on their specific needs, but try to keep it mostly here. Um, and as far as the learning curve, it was a good, like seeing students every second day, seeing them in person. Um, it was a good three weeks of them getting it for sure. It took time. Uh, yeah, it did. I will acknowledge that. And it and it it, um, it was much easier to do in person. So when I had new students who came in to the classroom when we were locked down, it took longer. It was a lot more difficult and um, yeah, it was a lot more difficult, for sure. Good question. Um, all right. Let's just bring it back to the PowerPoint here. So that's um, that's basically learner responsibility. And I'm just going to hope that I don't lose my mouse again. So to deal with uh, technical difficulties or things of that nature, did you actually ever have to um, like? schedule one-on-one -on -one meetings with them to help them out or Absolutely. like sort of te technological support or something like that? Yes, I will say uh, the one, when the one-on-one, -on -one, when we learned how to do the one-on-one -on -one meetings, we did it through channels. Um, it changed things for us completely. Um, the job did, you know, as most of you know, the job did come, become part teaching and part, you know, technical support there for a bit. Mm -hmm. Um, but the one-on-one -on -one meetings were the absolute best thing that could have happened, uh, especially because students aren't really comfortable, in my experience, speaking in front of each other, um, especially when they feel silly about a tech thing. So yeah, I use that a lot. So, so that's the learner responsibility. And uh, OneNote. So I'm going to be going back and forth between um, my PowerPoint and my OneNote. And I hope that that doesn't, uh, I hope that it works. <laughs> All right. 
sorry, I forgot. There's actually one more. Uh, this one works uh, for not not for online as much, but it works for the hybrid really, really well. And I think I'm going to use it as well when we go back in person. Um, and so another responsibility the student had was actually to reach out to me when they had a question, especially with individualized. And so in the collaboration space, um, in That's our team's cool. notebook, I, I sorry, <laughs> I created um, a, a little, basically a little section that says questions for teach, and the student would sign up. So I have Sheldon, Ellen, Frank, and Emily here, and they would indicate to me um, if they were online or in class, because I, if you did the hybrid, it gets kind of confusing a little bit at first, especially when you don't know the students names yet. Um, and then a, a reminder of the course code, if you're trying to keep track of all these individualized students and remember exactly what book they're on and what page they're on, they would sign up there as well. And so what I would do is when I was in the classroom, I would project this screen, uh, this uh, tab onto the smart board and I'd also share it with the online classroom. And so as you go, I would highlight when I'm done with a student and the student can kind of prepare themselves. Okay, I'm up next or I, I have some time and so they could keep working. And that actually worked uh, quite well um, until we were online and then it didn't, you know, matter as much. All right. All right, goal setting. <clears throat> um, for goal setting, I use Microsoft Forms. Like I said, I use Teams, but you can use Google Forms, JotForm, whatever it is. And um, I would actually insert this form directly into their notebook. And I would only have to do it once and it refreshes every time, every week for them. So it's automatic. It's so lovely to not have to think about it. It's just there for the student. Um, and basically it's just a little questionnaire for them to set their goals for the week. Um, the, the really cool thing about it is while they're setting their goals, you're getting real time data. So you can see who's done it. Uh, you can talk to them right away. You can catch a student right away uh, if something's kind of going on. And at the end of this, it actually collects all of this student information into an Excel spreadsheet for you. And so I'm going to show you sort of what that looks like. Um, and I have one, I have a bunch, I've modified them 14 times now by this point in the year, but I made one specifically for um, anyone who wants to use it. So a link that to share later on. Um, and it's already, the questions are there for you. It's all set up. All you have to do is share. So um, yeah, if you'd like that, that will definitely be ready for you. And so I'm just going to show you what that looks like. Thank you so much for your patience. Um, I say that every day to my students. All right. So this is it's in Emily's and Frank's as well, but this is uh, my student Sheldon here. And I've made a, a page for him called Motivation Monday. And all I've done is inserted the link, copied and pasted, inserted the link into here, and it's here for him every single week. And so I'll just show you what it looks like. Um, I always have them put in the date so that I can keep track of that. And the course number, again, because it's individualized, I don't know if any, whoever does has been doing this for a long time, bravo. It's amazing that you can keep all this information in your head. It's, oof, it's crazy. Um, I always ask them if they reached their goals from last week and to be really honest about that. And, you know, as I look through at the beginning of the year, it's a lot of no's, no's, and then you see some yeses coming in. And it's really nice to see that pattern. Um, I give them an opportunity to, to discuss why they didn't finish their goals or reflect on that if they'd like to um enter their goal for this week getting them to to write a specific goal i will say right students often say like finish english and you're like right but we're not we're at the start of you know sec two here like can we how many pages do you want to do and so i've modified it a little bit where some of my other ones have page i'm starting at page i want to finish you can modify it that way or uh you can word it differently um I just go over this individually with students every week. Don't forget to make it specific. How can we change this? And they, and they redo it if they haven't. Um, being in a position to write an exam or a pretest, again, is just an organizational tool for me. It reminds me, okay, I got to get that pretest ready. I got to get that exam ready for that student. It's a great reminder every week. Um, and then I give them the opportunity down here to really share anything that they want to share with me that they may not want to say verbally. Um, which, you know, on, especially when we're online, students weren't very comfortable with that. And so all they do is submit here and it refreshes and that's it. 
um, it takes some students, it takes 30 seconds, some students, it takes a minute. It doesn't take longer than a minute to do, which is really lovely. Students love not sitting there with a piece of paper writing out their goal paragraph. I've learned that the hard way. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, okay, and so I have no idea how I'm doing for time, but I just want to show good. Okay, I just want to show you quickly. Um, I took some screenshots, but again, when, you, when I send you the link, you'll be able to see all of this. And so in real time, I open up my, um, here, I'll make this a little bigger here. So in real time, I open up and I just go to the, the last student. So the, you know, 16 students, I go to number 17. It gives you the student's name and it gives you how much time it took them to complete right there. And it gives you their information. And all I need to do is click on this arrow and I just scroll through the next students. I go in that order every single Monday. They know the drill by now. They sign up sooner, I'll get to them sooner. The data collection looks, again, just a basic spreadsheet. I don't know if that's big enough here, but I, I changed the names for my students, but learner, you get learner A, B, C, D all the way down and you get all of their information. And all you need to do is click on this little arrow here and you can select one student. And so what it's gonna do is it's gonna collect that student's information into the spreadsheet, just like that. Um, this is really nice to send to your students as well when they finish a course so that when they do their reflection on their learning, they can see their progress, they can see how motivated they were, what was going on in their life, and they can kind of write that reflection or reflect on what they're going to do differently um, in the next book. Any questions about this? This is, uh, um, I think this is difficult to see when you can't actually see forms in front of you, you know, but if you have any questions, please feel free to ask any time. Okay, so that's all for goal setting. We're gonna move on to choice. This is a big one. Um, this is gonna be a little bit, obviously this looks, you can see right away, it's specific to ELA, uh, but across the board, it's, it's useful in all types of um, classes. I was using an application called Poly, which integrated right into the Teams classroom right away, but there's tons of, you know, uh, applications out there that use polls. And so I use this specifically for Wednesday workshops, which is where we would do mini general workshops. Usually, well, I say 10 to 20 minutes. The joke in my class is that I never stop talking because I only get one chance a week to teach, teach, and they're usually 20 minutes. I will say that. Uh, it is difficult to do a 10 minute lesson. Um, because I'm doing individualized, this is just an idea for anyone who's doing individualized, is I use pop culture references. Um, I am learning that I don't know pop culture references that well this year, because uh, my students are younger, a lot younger than they used to be. And so I used um, Game of Thrones here, but I got to, this summer I got to up my references. I am very aware of that. It's uh, always good to reflect on that one. Um, <clears throat> Now the choice really comes in on when we're talking about the topics. And so obviously you're going to guide your students a little bit like, you know, I'm not going to do a lesson on the Pythagorean theorem. Did I even say that right? I, right. That's not, that's not going to work, but I do sort of guide them. So I'm like, Hey, we're in our English class. We talk about what we want to learn in the English class, what the concepts are, and then they vote on what they need. And that's going to depend on where they're at. And um, I think as, you know, the more you teach adult ed, you, year to year, you never know what you're gonna get. Um, and so I think choice really becomes important because it gives you an idea of where your students are and what they need to learn about. Um, this year I learned most of my students had, have no idea how to write an essay, like no, no concept at all, just completely in the dark. Whereas I've had other years where they've come in and they know, they know everything already. And so that was, um, so I prepared a bunch of essay writing uh, workshops for them. Um, there's also in choice, I do give them the option of something called the quiet room. I got this uh, idea from a, a colleague of mine. And the idea is basically that if they show up on Wednesdays, they don't have to listen to me talk. They, they just don't. I mean, if they don't want to, if it's something that they already know, um, they can, um, you know, put their headphones on. If it's something maybe that day they're really focused on, they want to watch a video and finish a pretest, that's okay. I mean, of course, as long as they're working. Um, and so I give the option of the quiet room. I have them say right off the bat, if you don't want to participate, 
I'll open the quiet room for you and I put them in a different um, room. And honestly, it's only ever been the maximum, it's only been two students. So when you give them the choice, you'd actually be pretty surprised how much they do want to listen to you talk or listen to you teach, not talk. <laughs> Um, so that's been another aspect of choice um, that I brought in. And the last part of choice is our um, communication and connection, which I think as a name was a little too um, long and cheesy for the students. And so we went with a Friday chat that was that they voted on that one. We're going to call it Friday chat. And so um, you can use breakout rooms for this. I use channels and Every Friday at the start of class, they get the option. I ask them if they want to join. They either raise their hand or they send a private message to me. And this has honestly ranged from two, I think one time I had one student, so I just spoke to the student for a bit, um, and to 20 students. Like it's, it's really ranged depending on the week, depending on the model. Um, if they're big groups, I usually let them choose maybe another classmate that they want to be in a group with because, you know, discomfort levels. And um, they also get a choice of the topics every week. Now, I suggest them if no one suggests any, uh, of course, um, but they all also suggest topics that they want to talk about. And then they vote as a group on, um, on the, you know, the topic of the day. Um, and so you can see here in the picture, the poll is basically which question would you like to discuss? And I, I chose four questions that day and they, they voted on is civilization and order necessary to survival? Why or why not? I was shocked by that. Shocked that they chose that one, but that's what they wanted to talk about. And it was a really, um, it was a really great conversation that day specifically. Um, if you're running out of topics or running out of ideas, I started running out of ideas like oof, in December, I think, doing it every week. Um, and I was searching the internet and they weren't relevant for our students or what was going on. And I, trying to come up with them. And I found this uh, website, it's, it's on the New York Times website and it's called Learning Student Opinion. And every week they put uh, four or five new topics uh, to discuss with your students. And they're, it's, it's US specific, I will say, um, but um, they're really, really interesting and generate ideas about current events and things like that. So you can use that um, as well in your classroom if you'd like. So that's all about choice. Um, the last part, and I will try and wrap this up um, for sure. This is a pin that I actually own. Uh, it's one of my favorites. I wear it a lot at school. Um, safe, supportive environments, pretty difficult to do when there's, you know, a screen between you and you can't reach out to your students. So these are a couple of ideas. Um, build your course expectations and online rules verbally and in the collaborative space. I know we do that, you know, it's a practice a lot of teachers do with you know a, a whiteboard and things like that but really make a point to do that um, online even when it came to the online rules uh you know what is a reasonable amount of time that you can be away from your camera um you know we talked about um you know what's a reasonable excuse to leave your camera or you know obviously go to the washroom that's fine like i'm not going to police them but so we had that discussion it took honestly 30 minutes but we decided together what was reasonable for us as a classroom and then we followed those rules um, and that changed my teaching a lot because I was spending a lot of time asking them to be on camera. I was typing to them constantly and then we did it all together and they followed the rules. Nice and easy. Should have thought of that at the beginning. <laughs> um, another one that really works for really shy students, I have some students that have anxiety, is I allow them to type the answers. So if we're doing a lesson together, they can still, um, you know, be involved and participate in, in the classroom. They just aren't talking, they're typing, and I read it out loud to them. And that happens as well. And um, the last one is um, ask permission. I learned, um, especially with the online, especially with them being in their homes, uh, everything, everything that, you know, if I ask them if they want to do a one-on-one -on -one with me, if they don't want to that day, or they, I say, okay, great, we'll do it tomorrow. Right, so giving, asking them permission to, um, to basically connect with them um, has really helped as well. All right, so this is actually the last two slides are really just about the fun stuff. Uh, and the fun stuff, I think, you know, especially this year has become um, so much more important. And I've noticed that, you know, the more cohesion, I actually have two different groups. And one of my groups is more cohesive and they participate a lot more. And 
I actually watch them kind of push each other over the year. They are start telling each other, you know, what are you working on? What's your goal for this week? Uh, because they're closer together and we're more of a community. My other group harder, we got there eventually. Um, but a lot of these kind of things that seem maybe frivolous or seem like they're not part of it, they, they're, they're so much part of it. And that, that's how we've sort of built community um, online. And so I have a folder uh, in my classroom and it's called Stay Sane. Uh, it's sort of a joke <laughs> with my students. The goal for the year was to keep our sanity um, and get through school, obviously. And so in that folder, they, we made a, a class playlist at the beginning of the year on YouTube. So we all listened to each other's favorite songs. Um, when we started really locking down, we started making study music so students could um, you know, listen to music and work at the same time. There's a bunch of different types of like um, hertz and, and beats that you can listen to that help with focus. Um, and then we also started sharing focus strategies and apps that we use. Um, I use the, the Pomodoro effect. There's something called the tomato timer, which I can share as well. That's a really fun one, uh, especially for any students that have uh, ADD or ADHD, that's helpful. Um, there's an app called the forest app. Uh, and again, I'll share all these uh, in the presentation uh, where the longer you focus, the more trees you grow in the app. And that, I've had some students that really enjoyed that as well. I use it as well, honestly. Um, and so that's been really um, helpful. Um, and the last one. All right. So this is the extra extras stuff. And again, this really comes from my students. It comes from asking them uh, what they need. And uh, obviously, I. I, you know, encourage certain things or courage, but the, it does come from them. So um, think, pair, share, journal and discussion. When you're doing the hybrid, there is a way to actually bring your hybrid, your, your in-person uh, students and your online students together. And some of you've done this successfully. It works really well once you get the hang of it. Um, and it's simply using a, a microphone that looks, I don't know, I have like one of those little microphones. I don't know if you can see this here. Um, there we go. And just hooking up a microphone and putting the, the online students on the smart board, but they can turn their cameras off for this. So they don't have to be seen. And then we have a discussion and everyone can hear each other. And that, that really changed things for bringing people together for sure. Um, this was a student idea, show and tell pets edition. I have never seen so many 20, early 20 year olds get so excited about pets. It was, uh, I think so much got done that day. It was the most productive day for all of them. They were just so happy to see each other's dogs and cats and, you know, laugh a little bit. Um, and so that worked for them. Um, I use Kahoot. I know some, a lot of teachers use Kahoot. Uh, I use that as a get to know you um, game. And so students would send one fact about themselves that they wanted to share with the classroom. And then I turned them into questions and student had to guess which student it was. And that really got them talking to each other, telling, explaining their stories or explaining their fact. Um, we talked a lot, this came up a lot in, in my specific classroom. We talked a lot about uh, anti-racism this year and they were very interested in learning more about it. And uh, one student brought up that they didn't, everything was you know, US centric and they didn't know anything about black Canadian history. And so sort of halfway through the winter, I said, okay, we found, I found this uh, Unilearn series on YouTube. They're about seven minute clips and it's called 28 Moments of Black Canadian History. And we just watched one a week and discussed it and uh, had some great conversations from that as well. Um, and the last one, which made an attempt to do more recently is the Get Moving Challenge. Uh, but there wasn't a lot of buy-in here as we were <laughs> online, I'm not gonna lie. Um, it, it may have been just for me and a couple students, um, but the get moving challenge was basically, um, you know, uh, go take a picture of yourself gardening or go, you know, your, yourself on wheels and, you know, some are biking and some are taking a scooter and just ways to get them out of the house during lockdown safely, of course, um, and get them moving a little bit. And so having kind of all these little extra things, again, weren't a lot of preparation. They really came from students. Um, but they did bring us together as a community. And um, I think that for me, that really helped me get through the year as well, um, which was really nice. All right. Last thing uh, before we continue. I just wanted to thank you so much for listening to me. That was so great. 
um, and for I know how busy it is right now, and so I just really appreciate that you took the time um, to come out and listen to me talk. I really appreciate it. It's much different than students who don't answer you, <laughs> and so uh, I do really appreciate it. And um, again, I'll have links for all these things ready for you to Emily uh, and Frank and Mark and Ellen, the whole team. I'll have them for you, and uh, yeah, I hope you have a great discussion in the breakout rooms. Well, following up with the, Sarah, we have to thank you. It's obvious you've put a lot of time, effort, experimentation. I'm sure you've had your uh, your pitfalls and bumps and the rest of it. And uh, wow, I mean, the the effort you put into a, designing a class that really motivates students, makes them feel safe while combining the course outcomes and goals and tying that in. Uh, I'm sure this was a monumental effort and a lot of what we call upfront investment, which is now paying off dividends as you've gone through it. Mm -hmm. um, keeping with the choice sort of theme because we have about 15 minutes left i'm going to see if there's a quick uh, if you'd rather do a breakout room or a quick question period i see here uh, yes i agree question period works for me works for everyone uh yeah looks like uh so if anyone has direct questions with sarah be it with uh, starting from the school policy of keeping the camera on which i'm kind of curious about to see how that worked out and also from maybe my question is getting students to create their own online rules that they were along with uh, i mean it became more enforceable i mean that's my first question that i have so how long did it take for for you to get the students to agree on some of the basics and how much of it came from students and how much of it came from you so i I'm the one who's starting off the question period. Forgive me, so for dominating. No, that's fair. Uh, well, it was. I mean, uh, the policy was uh, from our center, right? It was school wide. So we, you know, as teachers, um, I think one of one of the main things was that if, you know, if we aren't following the policy, then we are sort of putting our colleagues in a um, in a difficult position. And so we had to kind of be united in that. Uh, if this is the policy, we need to be united. Um, it was difficult. I, I will say there was some uh, arguing. Uh, arguing is not the right word. Negotiating. There was some negotiating for sure. Um, you know, I'm really, really lucky to have a tech savvy admin. That is a, a big plus um, and very supportive uh, of us. Um, I will say that I got tired of the spending time sort of typing to them like hey can you put your camera on can i at least see your shoulder are you okay are you there that sort of stuff and i think they got tired of it too honestly at some point i think they just got tired of it because they i was like i'm yeah and then once we agreed they knew that if you know they get a five minute we agreed on a five minute warning so if they didn't answer a message and they didn't answer verbally and they didn't let me know where they were going. So if a student you know, has to go do something, it's fine. Um, then they would be removed from the class and they would be marked you know, absent. Um, and that worked because there was no arguing afterwards. It was just, they would get a warning and they were removed and they'd come back the next day and say, sorry. Yeah. I think part of it is community building though. I, I do think that um, you know, we can enforce the rules as much as we want, but they are adults. And so I think the more we build community, um, the more they showed respect for me and each other and our time. And, and that's really what, what matters, I think. Um, so, so Sarah, one of the things you mentioned is that you change things along the way to make it easier for your students and also to make it easier for yourself. So what was one of the things that you changed that uh, worked better for you? Good question. Um, I was doing uh, daily journals. Um, that was a big one. Uh, and exit tickets on top of everything else. And I didn't really realize, I think, how much uh, actual marking it was gonna be. The journals I'd done in person before, and you would just take, you know, you get this little thing, you take your stack of journals home and Sunday morning you have your coffee and you, you know, read over some journals, it was great. And they would bring discussion. Um, I found marking online, I don't know if any other teachers feel this way, I found giving feedback, sorry, not marking, feedback online, very difficult. It was so time consuming and I couldn't keep up with daily journals. And so we did it for a month and then we said, you know, we'll do communication and connection on Fridays instead. And that was, that was for my own sanity. They could have, they should have absolutely been practicing writing every single day. I, I know that they know that, but I'm a, doing okay now. So we're good. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Uh, so, um, and, and by the way, correct me if I am wrong, which happens very often, right? Um, if I understand correctly, the class that you're teaching, which 
are basically in adult education, but the classes that you're teaching are not necessarily restricted to a certain number of days like we are in certain school boards, including the EMSB. So it seems to me, based on everything you presented, that you had the luxury of time and you were not pressed for time, like get them ready for that exam, right? That's, so if that is correct, my yeah. question would be, from your experience, having actually experienced both worlds, mm -hmm. what would be some things that you would actually prioritize and say, you know what, seeing as in some context, you don't have enough time, these are two, three key things that I would definitely not negotiate and I would want to see in those classes. And the rest is maybe not necessarily doable or feasible in a context like ours at the MSB in, uh, in, in DBE, you know, CCB. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Um, I would say um, definitely the work online, uh, still organizing their work. So you still have access to that work all the time. I mean, depending on what you're assigning and things like that, having that kind of organized and that uh, pathway for them. Um, what else would I prioritize? Um, I would, it's just, man, I miss, I do miss teaching. I do love, I do love ELA, but I do miss teaching on a day. That's my, mostly my experience. Um, and I think giving them the option. So when you're kind of doing lessons, um, things like that, giving them the option to participate through typing. Um, I think a lot of students got left and I did this as well before I started doing it. So no criticism at all. Um, but a lot of students got kind of left to the wayside because they weren't comfortable speaking up uh, or participating in that sort of verbal way on camera. And so giving them that option, I think would be important. Um, the fun stuff, I do see that 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 is difficult when, when you're when you're cramming things in. I mean, I remember doing it as well, you know, trying to teach, uh, get them to the 4111 exam in uh, two weeks or something like pure madness for sure. Um, but I think particularly um, having those opportunities for community within the context of the course are important. And so even if you don't, if they're all in the same um, course, that's, that's beautiful. They, get, they can do those breakout rooms and still kind of make those connections while working on the coursework. And that, that's almost what I miss. I mean, all these, a lot of these things, they're, they're forced in there because I don't get to, to teach them one specific thing or work on one text with them. Um, but I think that connection aspects so of putting them in breakout rooms is really important. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Sarah. Lots of wonderful ideas as usual. Good. Thank you. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for the, um, oops, sorry, <laughs> clicking too fast. Yeah, it was wonderful. But given that you're teaching academic and, and we teach adult ed, um, really was struggling uh, this past session with having the cameras on. It really, um, I don't want to say frustrates me, but it's like, and um if you guys know me, you know, I'm always joking around. So I say, I feel like I'm, I'm, you know, in connection with Go. Sometimes I'll say, hey, Sarah, if you're here, answer me. And like, mm. <laughs> so it drove me nuts. I, I, I feel you. It's so frustrating when we're used to having that in-person connection and just no response. Yeah, and in the end, I honestly, I didn't manage. Usually, I'm a good salesperson, so I, I do get to sell my ideas. <laughs> but I didn't manage, especially with my spring session. I don't know how. Um, so I, I don't know if you have any ideas, any suggestions that could help us in regards with that. Given that they're adults, um, you can, you know, tell them off, really. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I'm clueless in that. I, I'm tired of talking with the black dots and circles. Yeah, I mean, we were, like I said, we were very lucky to have the, the camera on policy. Um, I did I did similar things like joking, like I, I actually don't, I don't know where it is right now. I should be here. I think I brought it to school, but I drew a, um, a tumbleweed on a piece of paper uh, and I cut it out. And I had it at the ready, like, I don't, I'm so sad it's not here, at the ready. So anytime, you know, I'm sort of talking to someone, no one's talking, I started making um, tumbleweed sounds. Some of you have heard me make the tumbleweed sound before. It sound like Darth Vader. It's, it's not very good. Sheldon is Do it. requesting Do the sound, that you so do the, the sound. Oh, the, the, the sound is, <laughs> it's so awful. It's so, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, and so I tried, so like, like you, I tried humor as well. And that kind of got them, right, coming back in a little bit. 
like they would okay the snap out of what they're doing and 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 that sort of thing um they do talk hey don't get me wrong it's just they don't um because i call their names we do like we take turns doing activities mm -hmm. it's a bit different than academic right so mm -hmm. they do take part well i have a few that are busy with kids that uh, except you know but um they do talk it's just a camera thing is not mm -hmm. on and from time to time some of them they do disappear as well yeah, that's that's difficult. Um, I haven't had the experience of having the camera off, but I've seen um, like my my partner was in school uh, taking college courses because he was in school and that that teacher had the same experience and he was the only one that had his actual camera on and talked to the teacher. Um, you know, I, I will say I think that's out of my my realm because like, we did have the camera on policy. Um, but as long as they're participating, I don't know how, I, how everyone feels about this, but for me, you know, as long as they're participating they are adults, you know, it became a point where uh, in the lockdown where I said, you show up, I show up, that, you know, that's where we're at. And it has been a hard year for them and it's been a hard year for us. And hey, if you got them talking, that's awesome. I think that's great. That's, I don't, I don't, I wish I had um, kind of better advice, but I, I think that's wonderful that they're participating and talking, lovely. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Yeah. I think I, I just take, take that for now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what else can I do? <laughs> yeah. And I think with the camera on, like one of the things my my uh, boss is here, he knows this though, um, but one of the things is that, you know, particular days where a student wasn't comfortable having their whole face, then, you know, they had their shoulder or they had the, you know, the top of their head, not all the time, but I want to know you're there. I answer me, you know, they answer my messages and they participate, but if they have, if I can see that they're there, I, I was okay with that, I would say, yeah. Yeah, it's just always you have a few that they disappear and um, mm. just you feel like you've been abandoned by them or yeah. they're not really, um, then they don't respect the class, you know, then it, it questions your class management, whereas it's not a real class, so our hands are tight really there. But I appreciate, I, 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 I'm going to let uh, other people ask their questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. We do have time for one more. If anyone's got anything to, to ask Sarah, so far as how she managed to manage all of this this year. Oh, I can. I'm just opening the chat now. By the way, <laughs> you got a lot of reading. Yeah. Very positive feedback. If you're you're feeling a little down, you should read it. Yes, Good. both Kim and I mentioned that we want to be Sarah when we grow up. So yeah. <laughs> the feeling is mutual. The feeling is mutual. I'm going, um, back to, uh, I'm going back to school. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. I do think like I think one of the reasons I just want to say one of the reasons I prefaced, uh, you know, my my context and uh, my situation was really to to point out that I, I do understand um, how lucky I am in the situation. I know there are, are some struggles for sure that I didn't have to face this year. And, um, I, you know, I, I hear you. I absolutely hear you. Um, if you, you know, couldn't do all these things, you know, I was able to um, based on the situation that I had, so. If we're likely to go back into the classroom, and hopefully we will be back in the classroom in August, all these technological experiments that you've done and been forced to migrate into online teaching, uh, the question still looms for all of us is that, how do we integrate this now in a kind of seamless way uh, into our classroom when people are in front of us? Now we have a double layer kind of thief in-person teaching and the online support. And Sarah, I mean, just the, the fact that you're tracking students in this manner and passing this information on to the next teacher, uh, there's some valuable data here that we could certainly glean. And uh, the question that remains for all of us here, all the stakeholders, is that now that we've undergone this one year of uh, really uh, experimentation and pitfalls and frustrations, and as you see, as uh, Sarah, you've met and overcome some of these obstacles and challenges, um, what are the implications for all of us next year when we do go back into class? And this is kind of uh, the direction that PET consultants will be looking at to see if we can enrich our students' experiences now by combining the face-to-face -face with the digital platforms that we've uh, all uh, embarked upon. So Sarah, once again, thank you so, so much for doing all of this, presenting these wonderful slides. Everyone here who's uh, had some thoughtful comments, creative questions, and some of them quite poignant and difficult to answer, uh, thank you for your active participation. We look forward to seeing you uh, in person, preferably sometime in August. So check out for the recording. Sarah, you will, will be uh, 
also putting those links that you mentioned and so have yourselves a great rest of the day great rest of the week and for those of you who won't be seeing each other this is our last epic call for this year uh we hope to do Except more there next is year. there is an si one for SI there is an SI, yes, on, yes. Yeah. on thursday yeah. happy june okay? 3rd on june 3rd june 3rd tomorrow yeah tomorrow is june 3rd indeed no no no, no. sorry it's no, thursday day. you're right thursday thursday, thursday. I have to keep thursday, three to four I have to keep quoting that comedian who says, since COVID happened, I don't know when I am anymore. And it seems to be yeah. the same struggles we're all having with time. It's all good. Once again, everyone, thank you so much. See you all soon. Take care. Thank you, Sarah.